Welcome to this podcast from Neurogastroenterology and Motility. It publishes original research and topical reviews on basic and clinical aspects of gastrointestinal sensation and motility, as well as brain-gut interaction. Welcome everyone to this month's podcast from Neurogastroenterology and Motility. My name is Adam Farmer and I'm a gastroenterologist at the Wingate Institute in London and I'm also multimedia editor for the journal. This month, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Michelle Noonlist. Michelle is head of the INSERM unit of Enteric Nervous System and Brain Gut Disorders in Nantes in France. Michelle, many thanks for joining us on the podcast and many congratulations to you and your co-authors on your paper entitled Lactobacillus Fermentum CECT5716 Prevents Stress-Induced Intestinal Barrier Dysfunction in Newborn Rats. So, Michelle, uh, what structural and functional changes happen in the GI tract in the neonatal period? Um, Adam, uh, thanks for this uh, invitation. So, what we have to, to think about the gut during the neonatal period is to remember its main mission, which is to basically, at the birth, to replace the role of the mother that is uh, to nourish the organ and allow the development of the whole uh, body. And uh, to do this, of course, all the function needed uh, to provide uh, nutrition, food, nutrients to the organ of the growing and evolving body uh, must be present. Uh, however, what is uh, very important to notice is that this neonatal period is uh, characterized by the maturation, the global maturation of the gut, its structure and its function. In particular, what has been well uh, described uh, is uh, that uh, various gut functions are maturing, such as the immune system, the intestinal epithelial barrier function, that is the function that allows to regulate paracellular and transcellular permeability. There is a development of uh, vascularization. And also uh, what is very important is that there is a development and maturation of the enteric nervous system that is a key regulator of gut homeostasis. So what diseases are um, heightened intestinal uh, permeability associated with? So first, maybe just a short definition of what we consider or what we uh, understanding by intestinal permeability. I think we are focusing in this study on two major function of uh, the intestinal epithelial lining, that is the paracellular permeability, that is characterized by the permeability between uh, intestinal epithelial cells and also transcellular permeability that is characterized by the uptake of macromolecules by the intestinal uh, epithelial cells. And what is uh, increasingly recognized and now is that there is an increased uh, uh, intestinal uh, permeability in many uh, chronic uh, diseases uh, in the adult, such as obesity, such as uh, IBS, uh, even in neurological disorders, uh, such as uh, Parkinson's disease or autism. However, it is also increasingly recognized that increased permeability also occurs in pediatric disorders, such as in uh, necrotizing uh, colitis or in food allergies. And also, maybe more importantly for uh, chronic disorders that develop later, there are many studies suggesting that increase the permeability during the neonatal period can increase the susceptibility later on in life to develop uh, chronic uh, disorders. Therefore, uh, approaches aimed at reinforcing barrier function, not only during the neonatal period, uh, in which uh, altered permeability occurs in disease that I mentioned previously, but also to prevent later on the development of chronic disorders is uh, of uh, therapeutical interest, but also of preventive interest to prevent the development of later chronic disorders. That's uh, very interesting. What, what can I ask you, what role do you think the microbiota plays in the maturation of the GI tract? I think there is... The, the microbiota and uh, the gut uh, have a close encounter during the neonatal period because as uh, it is well known, the gut is considered to be sterilized birth and uh, the early life stages are characterized by a progressive colonization of the gut by the microbiota, which acquires its full diversity 
probably by the age of three, but also probably continues a little bit over later in the adolescence. And what is increasingly recognized is that the microbiota is probably playing a central role in the maturation of various uh, GI functions, such as uh, um, the maturation of the immune system, the maturation of the enteric nervous system, the maturation of motor function. And uh, this is mainly highlighted by uh, animal experiments in which uh, germ-free uh, animals are used, uh, for which uh, there is an immaturity in biofunction, meaning that uh, vascularization is less well developed, that epithelial cell function is well developed, meaning that there is less, for instance, mucus production or antimicrobial peptide production in germ-free animals as compared to animals that are uh, colonized. And there are also very much interesting data in the neurogastroenterology field uh, showing that the microbiota is probably a key factor that favors the development of the enteric nervous system, in particular anterior glial cells, or also the maturation of the development of and the acquisition of the neurochemical phenotype that ultimately will contribute in the maturation of gut function, not only motility, but also probably barrier function, and recently shown also in the maturation of the immune system. And there is also very interesting data showing that there are different means that microbiota is using to favor the maturation, for instance, of the enteric nervous system, meaning that the microbiota probably is producing metabolites of interest, such as a short chain fatty acid, that can contribute, for instance, to the maturation of the enteric nervous system, or conversely, that direct components of the microbiota, such as uh, the popolysaccharide, can also be detected by neurons via TLR2 or TLR4 receptors, and in this way also favor the development of the enteric nervous system, and particularly uh, contributes to the development of the number of neurons over uh, this uh, period. Can you tell me a little about uh, Lactobacillus fermentum CECT5716? Uh, Yes, so this is uh, Lactobacillus fermentum CECT5716 uh, is a strain that has been isolated from the human uh, milk because we know that uh, there is also a microbiota in the breast. Uh, of course, the, it contains about 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 5 CFU, so that there is a low amount of ch bacterial charge that is in the, the breast and that the human milk is probably uh, considered as one of the environmental factors that contributes to the development and colonization of the microbiota by providing by itself some uh, bacteria that could have a uh, probiotic effect. And this strain, which has been isolated from the human uh, milk has previously been shown uh, to reduce infection in infants in a clinical studies and also to protect uh, uh, the gut in experimental animal models from infection or uh, from uh, DSS-induced uh, colitis. However, uh, the mechanism of action of Lactobacillus fermentum and whether it could uh, directly modulate this intestinal epithelial barrier function, in particular uh, reinforce intestinal epithelial barrier function during the neonatal period, remained uh, currently unknown. And this was uh, one of the hypotheses or one of the aim of the study based on this experimental hypothesis that had been uh, previously uh, identified uh, uh, both from uh, clinical studies and uh, experimental animal models showing a putative role. Of so, so what were the objectives of your study? So the objectives of the studies uh, were uh, twofold, basically. Were first, to show that uh, administration of this bacterial strain during the neonatal period uh, could uh, modulate uh, barrier function and uh, confer 
to this epithelial barrier, uh, enhanced protective response to stressors. Uh, and the stressor model that we have used in this study was uh, psychological stressors composed of either uh, maternal separation or uh, water avoidance stress, which are well described and well known stressors that activate the HPA uh, axis. What other methods did you use in your study? Uh, so the methods that were used were mainly uh, was a combination of uh, functional exploration in vivo and ex vivo of barrier function, meaning measuring uh, paracellular and transcellular permeability in vivo and paracellular and transcellular permeability ex vivo in specific organs of the gut, if one can say so, meaning in the ileum and in the colon and jejunum. We also uh, characterized uh, the impacts of lacto, uh, we also characterized the impact of lactoacyl fermentum uh, more on the mechanistic side upon permeability by measuring its influence on the expression of key tight junction protein in intestinal epithelium. So what were the key results uh, from your study? So the key results of the study were first ones we showed that uh, administration of the bacterial strain either over, over short term period, that is three days, or over longer time period, was uh, 15 days, was uh, to prevent the increase in permeability induced by psychological stress. And it prevented the increase both of paracellular permeability as well as of transcellular permeability. We next showed that these effects uh, on permeability were mainly restricted in the ileum and in the jejunum, but did not affect uh, the proximal uh, colon. We next showed or identified some uh, tight junction protein uh, that were uh, targeted, whose expression was modified by the administration of uh, lactobacillus fermentum. And in particular, we showed that uh, lactobacillus fermentum increased the expression of Z1 and prevented the stress-induced disorganization of the tight junction uh, network. Concerning other parameters and other functions that we uh, studied, we also showed uh, that uh, lactobacillus fermentum was able to prevent and, and or to reduce the significant increase in corticosteroid induced by the water avoidance stress or by the maternal stress. And uh, finally, on extra digestive uh, function, more specifically, we showed that uh, lactobacillus fermentum was able to increase the uh, interferon gamma production in uh, lymphocyte isolated from the spleen. And also that uh, lactobacillus fermentum was able to increase the uh, expiratory uh, behavior of, uh, of the newborn uh, rats. So what were the limitations of your study? But the major limitation of the study is, of course, that this is a study that has been performed in uh, animal models. And one of the questions uh, that arises is whether if the effect observed in animal models can be transferred and uh, reproduced in humans. Another probably major uh, limitation of the study is that the mechanism of action of the bacteria remains unknown, whether it is due to the production of specific metabolites or bacterial uh, compounds, meaning that whether uh, and this is some aspect that we have to be able to, to explore in the future. And also uh, the mechanism of modulation of the HPA axis by the bacteria uh, remains also 
unknown and questionable. So where do you think this probiotic and technology might be applicable in the future? I think if we try to extrapolate the animal study to the human, and since this bacteria has already be, been used in clinical trials, I think there is a possibility to extend, uh, uh, to validate its uh, therapeutic uh, application in pathologies in which a barrier function has been uh, always altered in the newborn, such as in, uh, micro in, in the treatment or prevention of neck. Also, it can be uh, considered to be used, for instance, in the treatment of uh, infant with uh, co colic. And uh, the idea is whether this bacteria strain can also be used for not only treating disorders of the newborn, but also of the adults could where altered bio function is also some major issue uh, is a, a question that can be uh, envisaged, uh, can be imagined for the, the future. So, uh, Michel, with that, I'd like to thank you and your co-authors for uh, an excellent paper this month and assisting in our, our podcast. I'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in and I look forward to welcoming you again on another installment of the podcast uh, uh, next month. Further information about this paper can be found on the journal website. We hope that you have enjoyed this podcast and we look forward to welcoming you to next month's edition.